There's so much that I want to say. So we're, I'm going to go through this really fast because I have a lot of slides. Um, go. This is my son, Josiah. He's operating the, uh, the device. So I direct a center called the Program for the Study of Developed Shorelines. We're a joint Duke University, Western Carolina University Center. We do both science and management under the same roof, which is, makes us unique nationally. I'm a geologist, and my co-director is an environmental manager and the policy wonk. So we do both National Science Foundation funded science, and we try and turn that into good policy management recommendations at many different levels. Go. <clears throat> um, we have a wide variety of data products. We provide service to government um, and private entities at many different levels and scopes. So for example, right now, we're working with the National Park Service to develop sea level rise vulnerability studies and adaptation plans for about 40 national seashores. Uh, like Cape Hatteras, this is sort of the poster child for relocation of infrastructure, moving the Cape Hatteras lighthouse. And the Park Service is to some degree on the vanguard of adaptation actions um, as, as far as adapting to storms and sea level rise in a way that's very forward looking. We have developed uh, a monitoring manual for the Park Service. Uh, we have helped individual communities look at th their vulnerability to sea level rise with particular emphasis on things like utilities and their infrastructure, like Hilton Head Island. <clears throat> We're involved in a dam removal project out in Port Angeles, Washington, uh, the nation's largest dam removal, very exciting work. Oh. Um, this is uh, the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. T too large, back, back, go back. Back button, back button, back button. Yeah, good. Two large dams have come out, and our interest is what happens when all the sediment gets to the end of the pipe out in the Juan de Fuca. Go. Uh, we maintain a, a, a database of every storm surge measurement ever taken in the United States of America. Um, if you're curious, you can go to our web browser, you can type in an address, and you can search for storm surge measurements within 5, 10, 20, 50 miles of the piece of property you th are considering buying. If, you're, uh, if it's low elevation, it's worth doing. We also have a Droid app for this. So if you have a smartphone, you, uh, when you're talking to the real estate agent, you can pull out your smartphone and you can say, let me just check the uh, storm surge heights for this particular property before you buy. <clears throat> Uh, we also, and I'll come back to this later, maintain the nation's only database of beach nourishment projects. So we track every single beach nourishment project that's been carried out in the United States of America. The size of the project, uh, how it was constructed, the f funding source, and, um, and this is also in a searchable online database that gets quite a, a lot of interest from a wide variety of entities. Post, we've been doing a tremendous amount of post-Sandy work for localities, for state government, for federal government. This is Maniloking, New Jersey, where they're about to get a $40 million sheet pile seawall. Um, we have an image database that you can also freely access. Uh, we do post-storm surveys. Uh, in fact, Corey Dean uh, and I flew post-Katrina together in a very small plane with no side to it. <laughs> um, and we make these images publicly available. Uh, this is public domain. There's a lot of stuff on there. So if you're interested in that, you're welcome to browse it. And we allow them to be used as long as they're not used for profit. And finally, we have a library of design documents for engineering project that goes back into the 1950s. Um, which is another unique data product that we have that we're in the process of putting into PDFs that make, also make available for distribution to the public. So today I want to talk about uh, doing good coastal management. And so the, 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 the take home message is that uh, coastal zone management is something that cannot be done one parcel at a time, cannot be done one community at a time, it has to be done regionally. It has to have big picture leadership behind it. Because um, the coast is sort of like managing water. 
you know, nobody out west would think that it would make sense to let one rancher take as much water out of the river as they want to. In fact, in places out west, you're not even allowed to collect the water off your roof if you don't have water rights for that piece of property. It has to be managed. Well, beaches are like that as well. Uh, sand is the water. And that sand is the resource that has to be managed because it's mobile, it moves along the shoreline, it builds and it adds to neighboring properties, and it requires a regional management picture. You can't just do it one parcel at a time. And if you do bad coastal management, and if you do micro-scale coastal management, that's the kind of thing that can fracture communities, that can tear communities apart, can turn one neighbor against another neighbor, and what you end up with is coastal management by litigation, which is the worst kind of coastal management, because then coastal management decisions are being made by judges who tend not to be scientists and tend not to be coastal managers. So let's start with just a brief peek at um, why the beaches are eroding in most cases. Um, I don't want to talk too much about global climate change. Um, skepticism about global climate change has become a, a little bit of uh, sort of an outlet for an excuse for not doing anything about the hazards that we know exist today. So mostly what I'd like to say to you today is that there's absolutely no doubt that the planet is warming and that sea level is rising. Scientific community is united on this. There's no question. One might quibble about the degree to which humans are driving that, that warming. And I think, I think, you know, is it 90%? Is it 70%? How much can we change by doing mitigation? But I think that from a coastal zone management perspective, the important message to take home, go to the next one, is, is that um, the planet's clearly warming. And, but, but we scientists have a communication problem with this. Um, and environmentalists have a communication problem with this. You know, you, you can't start with the nightmare scenario or the bad news or the three meters of sea level rise and expect people to want to plan 200 years down the road. Um, we need to do a better job of convincing people that the global climate change that we're dealing with right now is, um, is ongoing, it's actionable, and that we need to do something about it. Um, and the last thing that most folks want to see is another temperature graph. And I would argue, and I always have argued, that the worst way to, to convince people that the planet's getting warmer is with temperature data. Let me say that again. <laughs> the worst way to convince people that we have a warming planet that they need to worry about is with temperature graphs. Because, I mean, look at the y-axis on this, right? I mean, we're talking about tenths of degrees centigrade. That doesn't mean that much to most people. Um, not only that, when you have a cold winter, you know, people can say, oh, I just had to shovel that uh, 15 inches of global warming off my driveway. Next. The fact of the matter is, though, that the, the, you don't need thermometers to show you that the planet's getting warmer. The Earth does the averaging for us. Next. Oh. Next. Another one? Okay. The fact of the matter is that every single mountain glacier on every single continent, with a couple of small exceptions that are precipitation driven, are getting smaller. You don't need to read thermometers to understand that the planet's getting warmer. The Earth is averaging out those temperatures and telling us that that trend exists. And it's reflected both in those mountain glaciers, but also in the primary cause of the nation's eroding shorelines in rising sea level. Go ahead. 
These are uh, tide gauge observations going back to the 1880s from all around the world, plotted in one graph. There's no question that sea level is rising. No question. Globally, the volume of the global ocean is changing. No doubt about it. There are some places, in fact, where sea level is going down, but that's because the land surface is changing. So what we're talking about here is the volume of the global ocean. The only way you can change the volume of the global ocean is to warm the water so that it expands or melt the glaciers so that the water goes into the ocean. They're both related to global warming. Sea level is clearly rising. There's no question about it. The question is what we do about it. Next slide. You can keep going. Okay, another one. Sea level rise has also been accelerating over the last century. Keep going. This is satellite altimetry data. So the fact that sea level is rising is verified not just by the tide gauges, but by measuring it kajillions of times a year from space via satellites. The rate right now globally depending upon where you stop and start, it's around 3.1 to 3.2, 3.2 and millimeters per year. Doesn't sound like a lot. If you live where I live, where the slope of the coastal plain is one to 10,000, it's a lot. <clears throat> um, the basic problem we have on the coast right now is that this argument over who's causing the warming and the degree to which humans are causing it has uh, created this policy lapse where we're sort of conflating the debate over who's causing it and whether we should be mitigating climate change, which means pumping less greenhouse gases, whether the fact that we need to do something about it regardless of why it's happening. So I typically don't like to argue about mitigation because quite frankly, that's beyond me anyway as to how that would happen and how you would pay for it and how you would sell it. We do need to understand that shorelines are eroding, sea level is rising, and it's only gonna continue in the future. And you don't need a nightmare scenario of sea level rise to know that. But here's the real problem, all right? Sea level's rising, the shorelines are moving, that's been happening for 15,000 years since the end of the last ice age. But this is the real problem. Benidorm, Spain, 1974. Ever been to Benidorm, Spain, anybody? Okay, Benidorm, Spain, last year. Okay, go back, Joe, show us those two again. Okay. So the shorelines are going one way and we are going the other. This is the problem. Next slide. See, undeveloped shorelines, and I'm not arguing that we should undevelop all shorelines. Please understand, we love to go to the beach. We are not against development at the shore. But undeveloped shorelines, you have to understand, have no problem with rising sea level. They simply move. This is Cape Lookout, North Carolina. This is a very rapidly eroding shoreline, but there's still a big beach there. There's dunes, there's habitat. This is what beaches do. It's able to move. <laughs> the problem comes when the beaches are responding naturally to rising sea level in the storms, and there's infrastructure in the way. So, it has to be very, you know, you have to understand that erosion does not take away beaches. Erosion or shelling change moves them. Infrastructure takes away beaches. Next slide. Okay. It would be great if we could plan 100 years down the road and plan for an acceleration of the rate of sea level rise. But that's really not happening anywhere, quite frankly. Most communities don't have planning horizons that are that long. And it just doesn't happen that way. In fact, right now, we don't even really do a good job of responding to storms. So the rest of what I'm going to argue today is that 
The first step in responding logically to rising sea level and climate change is to have a sensible response to the hazards that we know exist at the coast today. That's today's coastal erosion, today's storms, the things that we know are happening now. And we do not have a sensible policy for responding to those events, the ones we know are happening. Next. Good coastal management should do this. It should protect the beach because that beach in most states is crown land, it's public land, it's public trust land. It's an economic resource for the entire community. If you own a hotel that is a half a mile away from the beach, in a beach town, the people in that hotel are probably going to the beach. The beach is the economic engine for most coastal towns. The beach is also used as a public transportation way, the intertidal zone or even above that, people drive on the beach, people walk down the beach. This is why most states have always recognized some degree of public trust land along that beach that people move along, people utilize for a whole bunch of different reasons. Going back centuries, they use it to fish, they use it to travel, and now we use it for recreation as an economic engine. Good coastal management allows you to protect the beach, we want to be able to protect our infrastructure and property and tax base in a way that fits into protecting the economic resource for the entire community. And you want to be able to protect the environment, which adds that aesthetic value um, to the community and, of course, to protect the biodiversity on our planet. This is what we don't want, right? Most communities can agree that this is not the kind of beach that they want to have, no offense, to Seabright, New Jersey. Right? <laughs> I mean, you have to be on like the third floor to see the ocean, even if you're an oceanfront house. Um, swimming here is treacherous. The only way you can go to the beach in Seabright, New Jersey is to pay $70 million to keep pumping sand in front of the seawall, and this is lo what it looks like when the sand goes away. Next slide. Uh, not to pick on the Northeast, this is uh, Holden Beach, North Carolina. Ideally, when you're managing the coast, you don't want septic tanks to be sort of the recreational backdrop for your community. This is an exhumed septic tank of uh, following Hurricane Fran down in North Carolina. And, um, you know, poorly managed uh, coastal development can result in things that, are, that you don't want to put on your tourism brochures. You know, this is the, New, the Jersey Shore after Sandy. So the Beach Nourishment Project is stripped away and you realize the degree to which the shoreline has been engineered, much of this was buried before the storm. The problem with this is that it, even though it looks great when it's buried during the storm, when you have the storm and it's gone, you have this period where either you need to immediately invest a huge amount of money to bury this, or you have a devalued coastal community. Next slide. So what do you do? Well, there have typically been three options when deciding what to do to protect property or to hold a shoreline in place for managing your community. The first has been hard structures. Even the Corps of Engineers really tries to discourage the building of seawalls these days, at least in public. Um, many states have recognized that seawalls cause the beach to disappear and have banned them. Progressive, environmentally conscious states like South Carolina, North Carolina. I can say that because I'm a southerner. <laughs> <laughs> Texas, Oregon, Maine. When you build seawalls, if you do not keep pumping sand in front of that seawall, this is what will happen because the beach is trying to move. The seawall does not stop the shoreline from eroding. It just draws a line in the sand, and over time, 
the beach will pinch out in front of that seawall. So when you build a structure like this, next slide, basically what you're committing yourself to is pumping sand in front of that structure forever. Or having no beach. Those are your two choices. Hmm. Carolina Beach, North Carolina. 32 beach nourishment intervals here. This is true whether that structure is rock or whether that structure is a geotextile bag or tube. If what you're trying to do is draw a line in the sand and say the shoreline shall not move past here, your only choice will be to keep a beach in front of where that line is. And if these structures are doing the job that they're intended to do, which is protect what's behind them, then you will have the same result. Next. I really like this seawall because, <laughs> because you can get a pretty good idea of its date of construction. This is, this is a Louisiana seawall. <laughs> but also notice there's no, no beach there. Many states, like South Carolina, have, have put in litigation the reason why they don't want sea balls. This is from uh, the state of South Carolina. The use of armoring in the form of hard erosion control devices such as sea walls, bulkheads, and riprap to protect erosion-threatened structures adjacent to the beach has not proven effective. They get over top during storms. Very rarely do we want to do the kind of engineering that would guarantee protection. These armoring devices have given a false sense of security to beachfront property owners. In reality, these hard structures, in many instances, have increased the vulnerability of beachfront property to damage from wind and waves. This legislation is from a very conservative legislature in a very conservative state. Thanks. Permanent erosion control structures may cause significant adverse impacts on the value and enjoyment of adjacent properties or public access to and use of the ocean beach. This is from the state of North Carolina. Previous one was from the state of South Carolina. Again, this is not driven by a desire for environmental protection. This is driven by a desire to protect an economic resource and limit litigation. Again, here you can see these are areas in a few areas in North Carolina that have been permitted to use sandbags for protection. The sandbags were supposed to be temporary. They've been there for more than 10 years now. And you see the same result with the sandbags that you would see with the seawall because the sandbags have been in place while the shoreline is moving. Uh, I won't spend too much time on groins. Next slide, Joseph. I mean, the, the downdrift impacts of groins is pretty obvious. It's been understood for a long time. Um, if you are stopping the river of sand, you're causing a downdrift deficit. Next slide. So let's move on to what's become the most popular method of shoreline protection in the United States, and that's beach nourishment which in general is preferable to building seawalls, although usually you get to do both, because it does maintain the shoreline position by rebuilding the beach, and it can provide a level of storm protection. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we feel it's getting out of hand to some degree in the United States, and the cost of it is not being tied directly to the real economics of the shoreline where those projects are happening. So here's the poster child. I gotta get a better picture for this. This is the poster child for, for beach nourishment. This is South Beach, Miami. So this is what South Beach looked like in the 70s because of seawalls and buildings. They'll tell you, of course, that Mother Nature had stolen their beach, but the buildings were the ones that stole the beach. They pumped up uh, the nation's largest federal beach <coughs> nourishment project, and you know what? It was worth every penny. Because in the 70s, you know, the only reason to go to Miami Beach was, uh, well, actually, they, people stopped going to Miami Beach in the 70s. Even the Germans stopped going. 
The beach project led to a revitalization of that economy and of that community, quite frankly. I mean, South Beach is the in spot now in South Florida. And that project had a lot to do with it. Not only that, they don't have nor'easters down there. So the projects last a lot longer in South Florida than they do from Jersey North. So, you know, this is a project that's probably worth, clearly worth the money. But then there's Hurricane Sandy. And this is what's going on post Sandy. So this is me quoting myself from an, an op-ed that I wrote. I should probably put that down there. Um, we have, as a nation, post Sandy, where, we're, where, where we got a $60 billion appropriations bill from Congress, where the Corps of Engineers was given $5 billion federal funds to do shoreline protection projects for future shoreline protection. This is in addition to the money they were given to put stuff back, okay, where it was. $5 billion future spending for shoreline protection. Congress didn't tell them what, they just said, go do it. Tell us what you're doing later. We have made a de facto decision, decision post Sandy, that we're going to hold all the beaches in place. Forever. Despite the fact that the science tells us that this is impossible over the long run, it probably doesn't make fiscal sense. It certainly doesn't make sense for the federal government to guarantee this. And we have absolutely no idea what the environmental impacts of doing so are. Yes, the President's Task Force released a document last August that had a lot of good information Okay, that had a lot of good language in it about being more sciency about how we do post-storm rebuilding, especially how it relates to flood maps. And it had lots of, the word resilient was in there, I think, 2,000 times because it doesn't really mean anything to anybody. Uh, the word adapt was in there a lot. Um, but they're vague, you know? This is the primary thing that we're spending federal dollars on as an adaptation action post Sandy. This is a house in Quag on Long Island. It's being raised. Here's another house, New Jersey, being raised. Even entire towns want to be raised now, like the ironically named Highlands, New Jersey. A, a wishful name for a coastal town, if ever there was one, on a barrier island. <clears throat> well, there's a problem with having raising your houses and your infrastructure as being your only adaptation action in response to a storm, and that is you still have to hold all the shorelines in place. If all you do is lift up the buildings, you still have to keep the beaches where they are or it will just all go to sea, which we know we're not gonna allow. It's sort of like you're standing in the river and the river is rising because the flood is coming. And rather than stepping out of the river, you decide just to keep rolling up your pants. <laughs> this is the primary response post Sandy. The Corps of Engineers is building a beach and a dune from Delaware to Connecticut. And I, liked, I really like this dune because they're putting sod on the backside of the sand dune so they can plant grass, which in the dune ecosystems that I've been in, they use, use, I call these things trapezoidal sand dikes. Now, I don't like to call them, show us the next picture, goes. Yeah, here's what it looks like on the top, you know? Isn't that a beautiful sand dune ecosystem? That's, <sighs> the Corps is building hundreds of miles of this, post Sandy, entirely at federal expense. This is what you have to do if what you decide to do is just raise buildings up as your primary response to a storm. Uh, this is the Ocean Parkway, Jones Beach. Um, Here's the trapezoidal dune, and within about three months of building it, it was being attacked by waves already again. Next slide. 
prompting a senior senator from the state of New York to rush to the Ocean Parkway to proclaim the feds have invested millions in rebuilding the road. Now they need to create a plan to protect it for years to come. We need a 50-year plan, said the senior senator from the state of New York who believes in climate change. We need a 50-year plan to hold this road in place that sits on a tiny barrier island that I can spit across where there's no other infrastructure other than this road. But you know what? Strangely, the United States Army Corps of Engineers thinks this is a good idea. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense, said Joe Vietri. Next slide. In fact, the Corps Post-Sandy, this number is way too low now, the Corps is going to be moving about 35 million cubic yards of sand in New Jersey and New York alone to put the beaches back in front of the houses. 35 million cubic yards. That's like filling Giant Stadium 17, 18 times. This is one of the things we track in our beach nourishment database. And the problem here from our perspective is that because we have used beach nourishment as the go-to for shoreline management, it's really hard in the United States of America now to find a beach that has not had a dredge and fill project on it. The, the endangered species on the coast is not the piping plover or a loggerhead sea turtle or a red knot. It's a beach that has not been engineered. Next slide. This is Seabright post Sandy. Uh, we couldn't get any closer to the project, so we're standing in the lobby of a hotel taking a picture of the Corps pumping up the new beach in front of Seabright. Next slide. This, this, this is, I love this. So this, it's, like, it's like one of those endlessly reflecting mirrors. So this is the picture that I was, was beside me in the lobby from three years ago. The same view. See the pumping up the beach there again. Manaloking, um, probably the most vulnerable barrier island along that stretch of shoreline in New Jersey, was torn in a half by Sandy. And what's the response? For, for these properties right here, we're spending about $120 million to put federal money to protect the road, arguably. That's our federal interest in this. Um, to put this sheet pile in, and then to do a large renourishment project going all the way up to Bayhead. All the houses will be right back where they were. <clears throat> there are also lots of private projects going on. The folks in Bridge and Sagaponic are paying for their own beach nourishment project. In fact, the oceanfront property owners are paying the entire cost of their beach nourishment project, God bless them, in Bridgehampton and Sagaponic. Like 30-something property owners are paying the entire cost for a several-mile beach nourishment project. This is the post-Sandy response. This is Long Beach Island, New York. Um, their boardwalk was shredded during Sandy. Federal taxpayers got them a new one. Uh, it's even better. This is, this is a boardwalk. We, we, don't, we don't have these in North Carolina. We especially don't have boardwalks that look like highways and... There's, there's even more infrastructure under this boardwalk, more utilities than there were before the storm, and it's exactly in the same place it was before the storm. Next. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then we get to the post Andy response and the idea of emergency general orders. So right after the storm, the governor of New York declared a general order, allowed people to repair any structures that were damaged, bulkheads, revetments, or something like that. The problem is that New York DEC doesn't really have anybody out in the field that can go check up on what's going on because they're understaffed, <laughs> they're underfunded, and they have really no enforcement capabilities. <laughs> so, so what you get is this. This is the village of Southampton, and this is post Sandy. This is happening with a village permit, even though it technically should be against the law in the state of North Carolina, if you talk to the State Department. Who, manages their who has their coastal zone management program. Next slide. This is how big these rocks are. These are the Southampton trustees who are trying to stop the project but have, were incapable of doing so. Next. 
They're bringing in two rocks per flatbed semi truck from I don't know where. The cost of just moving these things must have been astronomical. And this is to protect one home. One home in the village of Southampton. I've seen the things like this to protect like naval bases, you know, and power plants. But this is what's going, it's like the Wild West on Long Island right now. <clears throat> the regular folks are just doing this. And then they're putting nice sand dunes over it to make it look pretty. Next slide. Quag Village Beach takes on Mother Nature. That's the post-Sandy attitude on Long Island by moving massive amounts of sand. The big problem with this is that there's a grand disconnect between the localities and the science because the localities don't need to care about the science because all of these projects are paid for by the federal government. This is Dauphin Island, Alabama. This is my poster child for risk. This little place right here has received a federal disaster declaration seven times in the last 25 years. The federal government has gone back in there and put the roads back, put the beaches back, put the power grid back seven times in 25 years. <coughs> and people say to me, this is all investment property, by the way. So don't, you don't have to shed any tears. People say to me, well, gosh, those folks on Dauphin Island must be crazy to keep rebuilding those homes all those times. No, they're not crazy. They're making a perfectly reasonable economic decision based on the fact that all of the risk of being there is subsidized by the federal government and federal taxpayers. You are the crazy ones. We collectively are the crazy ones because we allow this to continue to happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should kick the people off this island. I'm saying that we should have market-based forces determining whether they rebuild or not. And as long as taxpayer dollars are paying for the rebuilding, this is not a free market. We are subsidizing the value of these properties. Every time there's a storm, we pump up another beach. <laughs> Just shows. Thanks. So here's the, here's the growing downside of beach nourishment. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing beach nourishment anywhere. I'm just saying we shouldn't be doing it everywhere. Beach nourishment is a never-ending commitment. It's a never-ending commitment, as long as sea level is rising, and that is for the foreseeable future. There's a disconnect between who benefits and who's paying that needs to be corrected. Because if you're the mayor of a coastal town in New Jersey, and right after Sandy, the federal government rushes in and says, hey, how'd you like a $48 million beach pumped back up in front of your roads and houses? Are you going to say, wait, no, hang on. I want to investigate the rate of sea level rise here, and I want to get new hazard maps before we make any decisions. Or are you going to say, pump, baby, pump? You don't need to care that much about the science or the risk or the hazards or the fiscal calculus if somebody else is taking care of the bill for you. And the problem is we pump up these giant wide beaches and it gives a false sense of security to new property owners, to the community, to everybody. <coughs> and then the environmental impacts. We have never, ever in the US quantified the cumulative impacts of these beach projects. And this is the real scary part. So remember, the core is moving the equivalent of the volume of like 18 giant stadiums, in New Jersey and New York. So there's borrow area impacts. They get this stuff from like a mile, mile and a half from the shore. There's borrow area impacts where they're taking the sand and that cascades up the food chain into fisheries in ways that we don't really understand. That's a lot of material, 32, 34 million cubic yards. It's a lot of stuff. And then we bury the intertidal zone with it. And it kills all the infaunal organisms. 
Now the argument is always made that they'll recover, and they do to some degree. But if you do it over and over and over again, every three years, every four years, every five years, there are cumulative impacts that we have never quantified. So you bury the intertidal zone, and that cascades up the food chain into foraging shorebirds and things like that. Next. And then if you do that everywhere, from Massachusetts to Texas, you have cumulative impacts that are not only temporal, doing these projects every several years, but spatial. And we have never added up the environmental impacts. And those environmental impacts, I would argue, probably are, are really economic impacts, especially to fisheries. The fisheries folks at NOAA are very concerned. And the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which, which requires environmental assessments requires you assess cumulative impacts but the core has never done it next so in summary on these mobile shorelines that we have now simply getting stuff up above the flood zone is not long-term adaptation and Building these McBeaches with these trapezoidal dunes is not restoration. It's engineering and it's done for the protection of the property. And we don't understand the cumulative impacts of doing these kinds of projects repeatedly and doing them everywhere. The, the hardest part is that we have, ab have absolutely no national plan for how to deal with this. And we need a national plan if we're going to be spending that kind of federal money or we should just stop spending the money. Why are we spending $5 billion on coastal protection in New Jersey and New York? Is it because that's the best place to spend it? It's better to spend it there than Massachusetts or North Carolina? No, we're spending the money there because that's where the last hurricane hit, or superstorm, whatever you want to call it. Where was the last place we spent a huge amount of money on coastal protection? Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Why did we spend it there? That's where Katrina hit. That's our national policy on coastal management. There really are no penalties for unwise development at the moment. We have ineffective regulatory, this is a cheery story, isn't it? <clears throat> and bad things happen in emergencies with post-storm general orders. We need to reform so many things, I, I'm not even going to get into it right now. But the primary thing that we need to reform, I think, is how the costs are factored into these decisions. And right now, um, in many places, the cost of that risk isn't factored into the local economy. And if the cost of that risk and of those hazards is factored into the local economy, then those folks will be a lot more interested in asking the right questions. Next. So we need, believe it or not, I'm a scientist who's standing here and telling you that what we need are market-based solutions. And we also need big picture regional coastal management. Not because I'm a Marxist, but because that's the way you have to do it. Because it's all connected, like water resource issues. Someone lives downstream. And if you don't manage it that way, if you manage it parcel by parcel, you will end up with coastal management by litigation. Last slide. And this all has to be done in advance. You have to have it planned in advance. You can't expect to have dramatic coastal adaptation strategies that come out of a, a disaster. When Chris, Christie and Obama are having their post-storm bromance, following the storm, you cannot expect there to be breathtaking leaps in how we're going to change our management of the coast. The easiest thing to do in emergency is to do what we did before, is to put things back. So planning and developing a regional strategy is really the only way this is ever going to happen. Storms are an opportunity to do things differently, but you cannot change that tack in the middle of the recovery from that storm. Thanks.
there are many questions that confront us that have answers. And we are not making our policy decisions in accord with the answers to those questions. So I want to talk a little bit about why is that. And I first got started thinking about this issue a few years ago when I was at Harvard and I heard a talk by a man named Max Bazerman, who was the co-author of this book, Predictable Surprises. And Max Bazerman is a professor at Harvard Business School. And his book um, focuses on business, you know, biz companies, businesses. But I think what he says applies in this arena as well. So his original question was, so well, actually, let me say, when he, when he, what he means by a predictable surprise is a disastrous thing that can happen to your company that you and everybody else has every reason to know is inevitably going to occur, and yet you don't do anything about it. Nothing is done about it. So eventually it happens and everyone is shocked and dismayed, but it's a predictable surprise. So, next slide. So he gave a few examples. One of them was Enron. So it was, I would say it was known to everyone because I know nothing about business and it was known to me that if you allow the companies that audit corporations to also sell them highly lucrative consulting services, you can reasonably expect that there's going to be a decline in the quality of audits if the audit is going to give bad news to the company. I would say not only can you reasonably expect it, I would say it is ordained by God that that's, <laughs> that's where you're going to end up. We embarked on this process. A whole bunch of companies had all kinds of bad results as a result of it. Enron was the most the collapse of Enron was perhaps the most spectacular, but it's hardly alone. Next slide. Locking the cabin, the cockpit door in an airplane. Have planes been hijacked? Did we know there were terrorists abroad in the world? It was ordained by God that someone was going to hijack an airplane by breaking into the cockpit. The Clinton administration actually put forward, according to Max, regulations that you're going to have to lock the door on your cockpit on your airplane. The airline industry went bonkers, said this is going to cost us a whole lot of money. The Clinton administration said, oh well, never mind. We didn't do it until something happened that caused us now to realize we have to have locks on the cockpit door in our airplanes. Next slide. The stock market crash. Now, I have to say in fairness, note that the scale does not go down to zero here. It's a somewhat deceptive graph. But there are definitely uh, bad things happened to the economy in 2008. And this was another you know, predict predictable surprise that even I couldn't predict. If you give people mortgages without requiring them to produce documents to show that they have the capacity to pay the mortgage, it is ordained by God that things are not going to go well. And yet everyone said, ooh, what a horrible thing that this could have happened. It was a predictable surprise. Okay, so Max's thinking is, all right, so all of these things are obvious. They're staring at they're in front of our faces. Why don't we act? And he says, and I think he's right, that there are a few reasons. One is action is painful. If we act to prevent these things, we're going to deprive us ourselves collectively of something. If we're the airlines, we're going to have to pay a bunch of money to put the locks on the cockpit doors. We would rather not do that, thank you very much. Number two, the benefit from acting may come years in the future. If you're a politician, it may the benefit from this painful action may not turn up until you're out of office. It may even not turn up until you're dead. The only thing that turns up immediately is the pain. So therefore, do you really want to be the one who steps up and says, OK, everyone's going to have a bad time about this, but trust me, years from now it will be better. 
And if the benefit is that some disastrous thing does not occur, people may not even realize that they have had a benefit. The fact that something didn't happen is not something you necessarily realize. All you feel is the pain. So in other words, this is a tremendous you know, logic loop that incentivizes not acting rather than acting. So um, to take action in this environment requires a certain amount of political courage, especially in the fundraising environment we're in now. Next slide. So here's another predictable surprise. This is something called the Keeling Curve. Uh, Charles Keeling, right? Is that his? Charles Keeling, Mauna Kea measured for years and years and years how much CO2 is there in the atmosphere. That's the answer. It's going up. Okay. Uh, next slide. As a result, sea level rise. Going up. Today's, oh, go back. Today's New York Times um, has a story about two new papers coming out on the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is giving way. It's, it's flowing into the ocean at a much faster rate. And if you really want to see something hair-raising, if I had known this was happening, I would have put this in the slides. Just Google something called the Larsen B ice sheet. Now, the Larsen B ice sheet is on the was on the peninsula of Antarctica. It was not actually something that's going to contribute to sea level rise directly because it was floating on the water. Things that are already floating on the water don't contribute to sea level rise. What's interesting about it is the way that ice sheet changed. When I first heard of the Larsen B ice sheet, it was because scientists were talking about the fact that it was eventually going to break up. But they said, it will not happen for thousands of years. And then you'd start to hear them say, well, it won't happen for hundreds of years. And then you'd start to hear them say, well, it won't happen for decades. Until it was, and it was a few years ago, unfortunately, I can't remember the year, but um, it started in February. In the space of a month, that thing disintegrated. So what that tell look it up, it's really interesting. But what it tells you is that these things have the capacity to move at a much faster clip than we think is even possible. Not to say that the West Antarctic ice sheet is going into the water tomorrow, but the lessons we have already learned from Antarctica tell us that this environment can change faster than we think. And people are suggesting that if that ice sheet really does go into the water, it's four feet additional of sea level rise minimum, which is a lot. I, there's um, an engineer named Bob Dean, who, no relation to me, um, I think he's actually quite a nice person. He, but, well, I mean, my family is too, but anyway. Um, so he is not somebody who embraces uh, the reality of climate change. In fact, I'll talk more about him in a minute. But I, so this is what, you know, a four level, a four foot rise in sea level. So I called him, I was writing about this, and I called him to say, what would happen if sea level, actually what I said was, what would happen if sea level rises three feet? What would happen in Florida, which is where he's based? And he said, sea level is not rising three feet. And I said, well, just hypothetically, suppose it did. And he said, if sea level rises a foot, we'll be able to hold about 85% of the beaches in Florida by dint of engineering, but we'll be able to keep them. If sea level rises two feet, the state of Florida is going to have to think very clearly, very, you know, spend a lot of time concentrating on what are you going to save and what are you going to let go, because quite a lot is going. If sea level rises three feet, he said, all bets are off. I would say you can say with confidence that sea levels rising by three feet by the end of the century, I would say probably even more. I don't know a single coastal geologist who thinks that's the maximum. People I know in coastal geology think it's the minimum. It's the floor, not the ceiling. And that doesn't mean that everything's going to be fine until 2100 when suddenly it will go up. It's going up all the time. So we'll have the one foot rise and the two foot rise before we get to the three foot rise. And it maybe is faster than 
we think. However, what is our response to this? Next slide. Uh, Rob, unfortunately, knows much more about this than I do. NC20 is an organization of the, oh, you kind of can't see it because it's off to the sides, the coastal, the 20 coastal counties in North Carolina. And when the state of North Carolina was thinking, like, okay, what should be our planning standard? When we think about what we're going to do going forward, what should we, how should we be planning for sea level rise? And the panel of scientists suggested you all should think about three feet by, the 20, by 2100. That was going to be terrible news for these counties because they're very low elevation. They weren't, a lot of things that they have now, they were going to have to reconcile themselves to losing because they just don't have the elevation. So what did they do? They lobbied the legislature. And for a while, the state became an international laughingstock because they lobbied the legislature basically to declare sea level was not going to rise <laughs> by that much. And what they ended up with was um, legislation that said, when you plan going forward for at least the next few years, you may not assume that there's going to be an acceleration of sea level rise. You may only extrapolate from sea level rise as we've had it going forward. Well, I don't, you know, that's better than nothing, but sea level rise is accelerating. So, okay, um, next slide. So we have something, this is uh, the general, the Government Accountability Office. They produce uh, periodically something called the high risk list, which is also, if you want to like get your blood pressure up and have a hair raising experience, <laughs> you can just go online and find this and it's all the things that the you know the government needs to look at because uh oh you know it's not looking so great um, one of their categories is climate change generally but in particular they have another category which is the national flood insurance program mm -hmm. so this is i would say the other big th way that the federal taxpayers are incentivizing unwise development at the coast. We allow people to buy insurance for it at rates that are ridiculously low. Um, this program started in 1968, ostensibly with the idea that the best and most efficient form of disaster relief was insurance. It was not government handouts after the disaster. It was having everybody to have insurance. So they started this program. You're going to be required to have the insurance, whatever. The problem was they set the rates at a very, very low level. This is insurance that is now almost unobtainable on the private market unless you go to somebody like Lloyd's, Lloyd's of London. But the taxpayers are providing it at very low rates. What happens? A well, I would say the insurance propelled a burst of building on the coast. I don't know whether I can actually prove that it's cause and effect. I can only say that the big, big burst of co development on the coast has occurred in the years since the advent of this insurance program. So we now have, um, according to the Congressional Research Service, as of last year, 5.6 million policies 1.3 trillion dollars in coverage, the largest unfunded liability of the federal government after Social Security. So, um, next slide. Ad proponents of this program used to say, oh well, it pays for itself with the premiums coming in. That has almost never been the case. There have been some years where it took in more in premiums than it paid out in claims, but mostly it did not. And after Andrew in 1992, that was never going to be the same. Next slide. And after Katrina, for sure it was never going to be the same, uh, never going to be the case. So this, is, this program has borrowed from the federal treasury. It is in the hole from which it will never climb its way out. Next slide. And now, Sandy, forget it. This is never going to be um, sustainable. So what happens? Um, we get uh, the Biggert Waters Act, 2012, a uh, piece of legislation to actually reform the flood insurance program, to say, OK, we have to have actuarially sound rates. 
And this is actually, this was my first page one story ever at the New York Times, was a story about a hearing in the House Banking Committee on making the flood insurance program actuarially sound. And I, the, the head of the program was testifying, and it was his last day on the job. <laughs> and so I said to him afterwards, so explain this to me. In other words, if you had a house and it was in a 10-year erosion hazard zone, the actuarially sound insurance rate on that house would be how much? And he said, 10% of the value of the house. That's an actuarially sound rate for a house in a 10-year erosion hazard zone, right? So they say, okay, we're going to have actuarially sound rates. So I was teaching um, a course on uh, coastal land use, and I said to my students, you just have to watch this because this law looks, you know, kind of good now. I, in fact, it looks so good that you know that pretty soon it's going to be shot in the back of the head and its corpse is going to be left to rot by the side of the road, which is exactly what is happening. They have just chipped away and chipped away and chipped away at it. You can have as many fabulous regulations as you want, but when they start to bite, people will fight back against them. And that's what's happening with this. Okay, so um, at that House committee hearing, um, what, so one of the things that was happening at this meeting was a group of coastal geologists were coming forward and saying, we should map erosion hazard areas on the coast. We should be able to tell people what is, what ha is, the, uh, what is our best estimate of what erosion is doing to any particular stretch of coast. That measure was defeated it, as part of the same thing. And a geologist came out of that meeting and he said to me, and I wish I had thought this phrase up myself because it sums the whole thing up perfectly. He said, there is a constituency of ignorance on the coast. <coughs> By which he meant there is information that we just do not want to look at because it's going to tell us we cannot do things we want to do. We are collectively a constituency of ignorance on the coast. So... There are a couple of other things I just want to mention briefly. Actually, one other thing, one other factor that comes into play here, and it's people study it under the rubric of cultural cognition. And I don't know whether you, if you've heard about this or not, there are researchers at Yale Law School and Yale University are deep into it, but other people are studying it as well. And what they're talking about well, as, one, as a, a, one of the leading researchers is a man named Dan Cahan from the law school. And so he poses the question, there are questions that are answerable. In fact, they have been answered. And yet we don't act on those answers. Why not? So what, what they're talking about is the tendency of people to form beliefs about risk that reflect and reinforce their commitments to a particular view of what an ideal society would be. And I can give you an example of that. The Yale people, they, they make a, um, a grid, and on one side it's whether you're hierarchical or egalitarian. That would be one axis, egalitarian, hierarchical. Or whether you are communitarian or... Um, individualistic, if that's your worldview. If you are, a, and you can, if you know where people stand on the hierarchical, uh, egalitarian or individualistic communitarian scales, those two scales, if you know where people are on those scales, you can put them in the grid and you can predict with a great deal of accuracy what their views will be on a whole raft of issues nuclear power, gun control, nanotechnology, the death penalty, all kinds of things. But how it plays, what it plays into here is if you are a person who believes that government is the problem, not the solution, it's going to be very hard for you to take this on, on board because are we going to get out of the climate change problem without national action or even international action? 
are we going to solve this problem by everybody just independently saying, I guess I'll put some solar panels on my roof? Probably not. Probably it's going to require national action or international action. And if, if that's the kind of thing that is repugnant to you, you're going to, you're going to perform whatever kind of mental gymnastics you have to in order to avoid going there. And that is kind of what we're seeing with the embrace of um, the contrarian views, the dissident views in climate. People are holding on to those. They're basically financed by the oil and coal industry and so on. The views of people who want to say this is not really an issue. And people are holding on to that because they don't want to look at the alternative. Um, so there is a need for some kind of a society-wide conversation based on shared values that we have because we do generally have a lot of values that we share. We have to identify what the shared values are and then work from them to move forward to some kind of a vision on this issue. Um, because either, otherwise I don't know where we're going to end up. There's a really interesting idea called geoengineering that you're starting to hear more and more about, which is the use of engineering techniques to f tune Earth's climate to undo some of the effects of climate change. For example, you could station mirrors in orbit between the Earth and the Sun to actually reflect sunlight back into space. You could inject chemicals like sulfites into, or sulfates, into the upper atmosphere of the Earth to make the planet shinier, to raise Earth's albedo, as it's called, make the planet shinier, which would cool things off down here. There are things like that that you could actually do. And it's really interesting to talk to the engineers who are thinking about this stuff because they don't even, it's like they don't want to breathe a word of it in public because they are afraid of causing people to believe that there's an engineering <laughs> fix to climate change which they don't think there is. But I went to a very interesting presentation and people talked about all the different things you could do and how you would do it and how you would test it. And testing is a big issue because you can only test it at scale. And you can't run, in other words, globally, and you can't run those experiments backwards. You know, they, they only go in one direction. But anyway, what was interesting to me was not, you know, how many tons of whatever it is would you have to pump into the atmosphere in order to get the effect you wanted? What's interesting to me is who's going to decide when it's time to do this? Who's going to decide what the ideal outcome is that we're shooting for? Who's going to decide what are acceptable adverse impacts that other people will have? Who's going to decide how to compensate those people? So I asked one of the leading people in this field, you know, who's going to answer those questions? And he said, uh, world government. <laughs> so I thought, okay, we're actually in trouble. So we, we need to have a, con we, we're, we're suffering, I think, from a lack of conversation about these issues. And, I, you know, it's like it, without the, in, which coming back to the information, without the information, we don't have the capacity to do that in a way that will produce good results. And I guess that's uh, enough for me, and we should have the questions and answers. Thank you very much, Corey, and thank you, Rob. And we do have time for a few questions and comments. Parker, would you like to go first? Uh, or anyone else? Usually it's Parker who goes first, but it can be someone else. Yes. I've always been curious about the word borrow and borrow sites. Yes. Uh, when, uh, I've heard shoals being called borrow sites and, and um, you know, for this enormous amount of sand that has to be brought to the beaches or, or wherever, um, it doesn't sound to me as though it's being borrowed. I mean, that sand's not getting paid back to the borrowers. Right? Where does it go? I mean, does Florida get bigger because of it, or where does that sand go? Great point. <laughs> well, you, you know, typically you're taking the sand yeah. from an area 
Typically, you're taking the sand from an area where it's relatively concentrated, putting it onto the beach. And um, more often than not, the sand is lost primarily in a storm, a storm event. It's transported mm -hmm. offshore. It's spread thinly. And that's not recoverable, really. You know, you need to get the sand from shoals or from thick accumulations from older geological deposits, inlets, you know, tidal deltas or something like that. So you're right. Uh, from a semantic point of view, the word borrow, technically not like ideal. Um, because the, the sand, it's not like the sand goes onto the beach and then refills the borrow area. It doesn't work that way. In most cases. Parker, yes. <laughs> spot there. Um, I was wondering, it strikes me as bizarre that there wouldn't be a greater outcry from the, the political movements that don't especially like the government um, to do away with publicly financed flood insurance. Uh, perhaps this movement would be led by the congressman from a little bit south of Milwaukee. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, why do you think that, that isn't a stronger uh, movement, and why do you think that people aren't calling for that more publicly? Um, so, this insurance is very popular on the coast. It is very popular among people who have big investments in real estate on the coast. Those people tend to be powerful people who do not particularly want to be crossed. Well, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm teaching now, and this is like, you know, whatever the, whatever the actual topic of the course is, what my real lesson for my students is, you have to get out of this university and reform the campaign finance situation. Um, and I hope they manage to do it, because the rest of us haven't done it so far. But um, that's a real issue. It is, um, I have heard that program described, I would say, accurately as the moral equivalent of throwing dollar bills into the surf. And you know, there, I mean, there was uh, a, pardon the use of this term, but for lack of a better term, a Tea Party revolt um, in Congress against the Sandy Appropriations Bill. And they were pilloried by both parties. <laughs> they were pilloried by the Republicans in New Jersey and New York, and they were pilloried by the Democrats. And they ended up giving in. And many of them did not vote for the Sandy Appropriations Bill. But, um, you know, there, there was, um, on that side of the aisle, you know, real discomfort with spending those kinds of dollars. And to, to some great degree, they were right. There was a lot of extra stuff in there, you know. When, you're, when you call it an emergency appropriations bill, but billions of it are for future spending, for future storm protection, that's not something that needs to go into an emergency appropriations bill. That's something that could be done in some other way. Um, but the political machine from both sides of the aisle, you know, based on the interests that they were protecting locally, ran right over that discussion. Okay, who's next? Yes. short-term correction or mitigation. In other words, you know, we're looking at, you know, 20 years. What, you know, can we, can we hold on to this beach for the next 20 years? Or can we hold on to this beach for the next 40 years? But the fact is that we have accelerated climate change. So, I mean, it seems like we really have to take a long view on these issues and nobody's doing it and they don't want to because we think in the present and people are greedy and they want the money now they want to sell their houses now, and they're not looking in the long-term view that all of this is going in the ocean. It's really going to go into the ocean. People respond um, to incentives, and we don't incentivize long-term thinking. We collectively incentivize short-term thinking. And as long as that's our outlook, it's not reasonable to expect that people are going to abandon the short term for the long term, even in, with a predictable surprise. 
I, th I I'm afraid. Well, the UN just came out with its report saying that in 10 to 20 years, we won't be able to go back, you know. And, and, and let me just say, you know, to be fair, the bad decision making does not just benefit wealthy oceanfront property owners. Right. I, I mean, you know, post Sandy, you know, we, we're rebuilding a wide variety of communities in, 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 in incredibly vulnerable areas. And, and the, the flood insurance program only pays up to about $250,000. So where I work in the Hamptons, for example, in Bridgehampton, I mean, you know, that doesn't pay for the driveway. Wait, 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 but wait, but wait, but wait. <laughs> so, no, well, that's, I, the, that's true. 250000 for the dwelling and 150000 for the contents. But what that means, if you're someone with a $4 million house, you can go to Lloyd's of London or somewhere and get ins an insurance policy for that house, and you have, in effect, a $400,000 deductible because that's what you're going to get from the federal government. And that takes the cost of the insurance way down. So, it, yes, that's correct. But the other thing I wanted to say is, though, when, you know, we have these, like, supposedly teachable moments like Sandy, and, you know, it's not in our national character to say, oh, well, I guess this means we have to give up. Our national character is to say, we're not taking this. We're going to come back bigger and better than ever. And, you know, on some level, I admire that. But that is what leads us to make some of these bad decisions. But, but it is within our national character, sorry, to require individual responsibility for actions. And, I mean, that, that is a part of the American spirit. And, you know, the biggest problem I think that we have at the moment, I, I was at a housing and an urban development rebuild by design competition in New Jersey, and we had a mayor from a coastal town there. And when she was talking about her town in the intro, the thing she was proudest of was that they had the second lowest tax rates in the state of New Jersey. Well, they were about to get $78 million from the federal government to rebuild the roads, uh, the infrastructure, raise a bunch of houses and pump a beach on there. And, you know, and she's standing there telling us that she hopes that someday soon they will have the lowest property tax rates in the state of New Jersey. And that's where the real disconnect is. Y y you know, I mean, the, I, I do not believe we should send the stormtroopers in and order people off the coast. We love to go to the beach. We stay in oceanfront homes when we go quite frequently. I should be paying a little bit more to do so because that economy should be paying its own way. And then the science will matter more, and the hazards will matter more, and the cost of being there will be factored into that economy. And in some places, it'll still make sense, and in some places, it will not. It will, not. It will just not make sense. Here's a question in the back. Yes. between man and the ecosystem, if the ecosystem wins out and our pro private property rights are diminished, then that just is not the way he wants to live his life. Whoa. And this is somebody who I, can, I respect. I consider them a friend. They're very well versed in the, in the environmental issues. How do you gain, gain, get, gather those people into the global conversation? This is not necessarily a question of ignorance. It's a question of uh, the core of private property rights over environmental protection. <sighs> <laughs> what are your concealed weapons regulations here? <laughs> because in South Carolina now you can take guns into church. So is it? No, I actually I remember one, there's a man named, well, uh, Rob's co-author, Oren Pilkey, who was an ardent uh, opponent of all kinds of coastal things. and. 
he gave a uh, talk somewhere and there I saw a poster for the talk and it said he was going to appear at such and such a place whatever blah 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 blah, blah. and then down at the bottom across at the poster in big letters it said police will be present <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh good but anyway um, you know I, that's a really tough question I don't know but what I would say is that you know there are probably is some core of shared values that you that if you worked hard, maybe, you could identify those shared values and say, given these shared values and given the problems that we face, you know, what, what does this suggest to us? Um, private property rights is a really interesting issue on the, course there, on the coast. There's been a lot of litigation, some really interesting Supreme Court decisions that a lot of people are quite uh, critical of, but Private property rights are fundamental to our democracy. And we would not want to live in a society in which people did not have private property rights. So I, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I think if this, there were an easy answer to that question, we would all be doing something else right now. You know, we, um, I, I don't think the situation is easy. We have kind of dug ourselves into... A, a deep hole. This hole, I, I hope, we can dig ourselves out of. But it's, it's not going to be done by force. Um, and I think it's going to be difficult. But I think, the, I think actually the hard thing is to say we have to reach out to the other side and say, all right, what are the things that we can agree about at the outset? And then once we identify those things, let's see, how can that... A uh, group of shared values carry us forward in a way that's useful. And even if nobody gets to be exactly where he or she wants to be, that we can say, well, where we are is better than where we started. And the biggest risk to not having that compact is, is that you will all end up in litigation and, and that that's where the decisions will be made. And when it happens that way, who knows how it comes out? Yeah. Who knows how it comes out? Uh, you may come out, end up with everybody un unhappy. There's a small gated private community in South Carolina we're working in right now where there are a handful of property owners who um, have just probably today, while I've been sitting here, gotten dispensation from the legislature to build a seawall, um, which they should not be allowed to do in South Carolina. And um, the people who will litigate this against them are their neighbors. And they're gearing up to do so already. And these are people who are living side by side in one gated community. And um, th this is a case where the environmental groups are pretty much standing back right now because the neighbors are about to tear each other to shreds over this issue. And um, so what, you know, when, when you don't have good coastal management, and I'll just call it that without trying to define it any further for you here in Nantucket, you know, what, what you end up with is a situation where you can not just lose the economic value of the beaches and what that brings to the community, but you can damage that social fabric of the community that many people come here for that don't go to the beach. <laughs> the, the cocktail parties, the, the summer life, whatever it is that you, dinner with friends, um, I don't, whatever y'all do um, here <laughs> in the summer that makes people happy. Um, I have, you know, I've seen it happen. And there are places right now, like the village of Quag in New York, where that's about to happen, where you literally over... Uh, geocubes is primarily what they're doing. They're not geotubes, geocubes, where you have neighbor suing neighbor. They can't talk to each other anymore. You know, their insurance companies are fighting. And, you know, nobody wants that. And even the, the most individualist of persons who believes in private property rights, and I've got a piece of land in North Carolina that I would fight over that we raise chickens on, that we love, that we are married to. So I get it, you know? Um, it's in the Appalachians, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. You won't, need to, you won't need to worry about that for five millennia. You know, I mean, if you... 
that that you know the the risk of losing that community fabric should you would think should bring most people to the table. Now there's some people that just won't, but you know most folks. John, one more question. I okay, uh, let's take a question right here. Is anyone getting it right? Are there other countries or other situations where they're developing policies that are working? <laughs> Um, I, you know, everybody likes to talk about the Dutch, but, you know, the, all you do is raise the, 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 the you know, it's, okay, so the, you know, the Dutch don't have to deal with nearly what we have to deal with. I just flew over the coast of Amsterdam about two weeks ago on my way into the airport. You know, there's nothing there, okay, on the coast, right? I mean, it's, it, um, yes, they had a lot of people that were at flood risk, but, um, I'm guessing that we would never buy into the kind of governmental control that they have there to, to and, and besides, they're, you know, we're, they're a small country that's all at risk. Um, it's easy to make the case there that they should be suspending, you know, spending a substantial amount of their GDP on coastal protection, and it's easy to make the case for, you know, getting people out of harm's way. I mean, what are they going to do? M move to Kazakhstan, we're, we're a big country, you know, we're, we're not really analogous in, in my mind. And uh, so... Uh, so Australia has a lot of regulations that keep people off the beach itself. And so lots of times if you go to a beach resort in Australia, you might take a golf cart or something to actually get to the water because the buildings are in land. I mean, not, it's not all over the place, but, it, it, but often in Australia. Um, New Zealand is very conscious of not um, basically wrecking its natural um, environment. And so their beach regulations are better. But, um, and even like, you know, Oregon in, in our country is relatively better at just keeping people off the beach. Well, you can't say universally, but, but better. So it can happen. But, you know, what the problem is that, the, that as, as Rob is saying, that the, the, the forces of the market would probably be the most effective way of getting people right off of the beach if they actually had to pay the freight. But they don't. So as long as we're incentivizing this kind of development, it's unrealistic to expect it not to happen. But that ends when the natural disasters get to a point where they overwhelm us. Well, we're getting and to that's that. That's a sad comment. We're, well, we're getting to that point now. The most expensive, the 10 most expensive natural disasters in the history of the country, almost all of them are within the last few years. And it's not because the weather is worse necessarily, it's because the amount of development in places where we shouldn't be developing is whoop, way up. Well, I want to thank our speakers for their wonderful contributions tonight. Please join me in thanking them. I want to... I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience and asking great questions. I want to thank Josiah for being the most patient and helpful young person here. And Nicole, thank you as well. Thank you all for coming, and I recommend a hour of laughing yoga as a means of recovery. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.